Good afternoon. It's a huge privilege to welcome you here to Policy Exchange in London. I'm Ross Campbell, Special Correspondent at Times Radio, the national radio station of the Times and the Sunday Times newspapers. And it's a great privilege to be chairing this event for Conservative Party Conference entitled, What Do We Want From The Civil Service? Now, wherever you're joining us from uh, online, you can participate in the discussion with our excellent panelists today in two ways. So if you're watching through the Conservative Party feed, you can send in your questions uh, via the chat box function. Or if you're watching on Zoom, you can raise your hand and we will pick up your question later in the discussion. And it's a warm, warm welcome to you wherever you are watching this from today. Um, this is a hugely significant policy issue uh, for the current administration, and we're joined by some very knowledgeable and experienced speakers to dig into the question before us today. I'll introduce them. Joining us in a few moments, uh, he's not just here yet, but joining us very shortly, will be Lord uh, Theo Agnew. He's the Minister for Efficiency and Transformation in the Cabinet Office. He's also jointly a minister in the Treasury, and he leads in the centre of government on the broad sweep of public sector reform, including on civil service reform. Joining us uh, on Zoom are the rest of our panellists, Baroness Simone Finn, a Cabinet Office non-executive director, and a member of Nick Herbert's Commission on Smart Government, but of course also a highly experienced uh, peer serving in government. Uh, she was a special advisor in the Cabinet Office under the Coalition, also in the Foreign Office, the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, and has worked very closely on public sector reform issues. Dame Patricia Hodgson, a highly experienced public servant and regulator. She was formerly chairman of Ofcom through a three-year term from April 2014, having begun her career as a journalist and later a senior executive at the BBC. She served on a numerous number of Ofcom committees and also advised government on many topics, including higher education, she was a member of the Committee for Standards in Public Life and is also a member of the Independent Commission on Freedom of Information and, of course, is one of our highly valued trustees here at Policy Exchange. Sir David Liddington was MP for Aylesbury uh, from 1992 to 2019 and served for 20 years on the Conservative front bench as an opposition spokesman or minister. Uh, in government, he was Minister for Europe at the Foreign Office, Leader of the House of Commons, Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor, and CDL, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, uh, which is also responsible as Minister for the Cabinet Office under Theresa May, acting as the de facto Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, lastly, in the kind of spirit of deference to the experience gathered here, uh, I have some very recent experience in this field as a former senior special advisor to the Prime Minister in the Number 10 Policy Unit, uh, where I worked on public sector reform and civil service reform in particular. So welcome to all of our panellists and welcome to Lord Agnew, who is uh, joining us as well. Uh, I've introduced you already, Lord Agnew. Um, before we dive in to this question, um, setting some parameters, the question, what do we want from the civil service, is of extreme relevance to this administration. It's the basic question that all governments have to answer because fundamentally civil servants deliver government policy. But beyond that, it's of particularly deep interest to ministers in the current government, and that is because there is a sense, as we know most recently from Michael Gove's Ditchley lecture, that the civil service does need to change in order to deliver ministers' wishes uh, better. It needs to be, as Michael Gove said, uh, more skilled, better located, more innovative and more rigorous. So that outlines some of the intentions of the government. Um, but I wonder whether it's easier for us anecdotally sometimes to answer the opposite question here, which is what don't we want from the civil service? It's much harder to engage with the true question at hand. What do we want from the civil service in an operational sense? with a kind of nod to the fact that civil service reform is an enterprise which has been embarked on by many, if not all, governments, and has been a long-term project for the Conservative government over the past 10 years, uh, so it's not new, but also in a philosophical sense to slightly change that question, which is what do we want our civil service to be for, not just what do we want it to do? Um, the civil service has been in the vanguard of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, and the civil service will continue to be the prime mover, really, in delivering the government's manifesto commitments as that challenge becomes even greater given uh, the consequences of the pandemic. And I know before we begin to touch on the discussion that all of our contributors would want to start by paying tribute to the extremely hard work of civil servants, both in the pandemic response and before it. I'd like to invite each of our contributors to maybe give a five-minute overview of their response to what they want 
from the civil service. Lord Agnew, could we start with you as the minister working most keenly on these issues responsible uh, in the current administration? Give us your five minutes of opening thoughts on what you want the civil service to do. What should it do? Yes, thank you, Ross. And it's good to be here because it was policy exchange that started my journey into politics 15 years ago. And it's important to stress at the outset that whilst I think that the system is broken, the, the, it's not the people, it's good people are trapped inside the system. I've worked with civil servants now for over 10 years, so longer than most ministers and, and in several different departments, and I've worked extremely well with them. But the, the mandarins who defend the status quo speak lovingly of this thing called the North Pavilion Reform. So that happened 10 years ago. Actually, they published that report in 1853. And unbeknown to some of these people at the top of civil service, things have actually moved on. But it's even worse than that, because 180 years ago, they put in place some rigor in terms of exams for promotion. And a lot of that has been watered down. And we don't have proper technical assessments before promotions are made. And so this results in a desperate shortage of practical commercial skills, financial procurement, contract management. There's even a lack of understanding as to why these are so vital. I had to explain to a Treasury official a few weeks ago what working capital was. When I took over the post in February, I discovered that the key performance indicators are the, really the most important measures of our most important contracts in White Bull were not being measured. We only had 20% of the very biggest contracts. And even after six months of chasing, there are still big gaps. There's over a billion pounds worth of IT contracts that have overrun their expiration dates and have not been renegotiated. There's an obsession with policy as a theoretical train of thought. But a good, a good policy is one that positively impacts citizens at the point of use. Problem is the people responsible for implementing the policies are rarely in the room when the policies are conceived. And of course, those most dependent on policies are on good policies are the ones most vulnerable, those who need policing, health and social care, are the ones that can't buy their way out of the problem. And in our newly formatted blue wall government, we will ignore that at our peril. We talk about diversity. Everyone talks of that. Diversity champion is a very safe place to be, but it misses a vital point, the diversity of geography and cognition. We've got the most over-centralised bureaucracy in the Western world. And whilst they might be diverse in colour and gender, which I absolutely applaud, the overwhelming majority are urban metropolitan thinkers. This week, we'll spat with The Guardian on consultants, on the narcotic addiction to consultancy, sums it up. It's better to stay in a state of learned helplessness and hire consultants and support civil servants in developing the right skills. We've got a far stream system that recruits almost exactly the same people as the consultancies. The difference is the consultancies spend two weeks giving them a top notch training course and then unleash them on our civil service machine at £580 an hour. We marginalise our best young people. Apparently preparing for Brexit is a surprise to my critics, even though we've been in this position for over four years. So I, I have some proposals of what I think we should do, but I, I, I can come back to those, Ross, later if you like. Thank you, Lord Agnew, for that introduction. Uh, typically, uh, a comprehensive introduction to some of the themes, including skills and capability, location, uh, the relationship and culture of the civil service. Uh, Baroness Finn, let's let's come to you and ask where you would pick up some of those thoughts and, and offer us your own. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much. And um, I, I do just want to sort of say at the beginning that it's, it's great to be here. Um, and the views uh, that I express are my own, not those of the Cabinet Office. Um, what um, I like, Lord Agnew, I would absolutely uh, pay tribute to the fact that there are many brilliant civil servants in the civil service, um, and many great policy, many great officials who I've worked with. But um, but but the civil service itself is is less than um, a, less than brilliant at implementation. Um, I think it would be fair to say. So. When, to go to the first question of proper delivery of, service, of, of what is the civil service for, I would say that the civil service is there to implement government policy and to deliver services properly. Um, and 
you know, and the, the key part of their role is therefore implementation. Whenever I listen to former cabinet secretaries on the radio, they would say the civil service is there to advise and to challenge. Yes, it is. It's absolutely there to advise and challenge, but it's ultimately there to implement properly. And that and that that's uh, and, and maintaining the skills and capability to implement government policy and deliver services for the citizen, which is what they're meant to be doing. It's and this is the key fact is the most important part. So um, so I would actually just touch on a few things and go of what in terms of what Lord Agnew said, because they were sort of forefront of mine. Um, in, in Whitehall, there's a there's a sort of um, there's no parity of esteem between operational um, roles and the policy roles. There's there are the grand mandarins who do policy and there are the the sort of the, the below the salt officials who do the operational and technical and financial management which is absolutely outrageous because actually those are the key skills that we need to implement policy in a, in a modern age. To give you an example of how divorced the policy is from implementation, when, um, when the universal credit was being worked on when I worked in the coalition, um, you know, policy was being developed in Whitehall, the implementation was in Sheffield and IT development was in Warrington and there was very little link up between the three and then you wonder why things don't actually work properly so it, so, so this the, and we have got to start valuing the really key core skills that make us the service work um, and um, part of this is going to um, the the accountability point for per, for um, permanent secretaries we introduced in the in the coalition um, a policy of fixed tenure for permanent secretaries to sharpen accountability, to allow them to move on. And of course, the papers are very busy saying, oh, people are being sacked. Well, they're not being sacked. It, it's a fixed tenure point. It was actually announced by Tony Blair in 2004, but it, um, it wasn't actually implemented. So we did actually get around to implement it. And I'm very pleased to see that that actually is, is working because it's a, it's a key part of of, of the accountability of the minister to, to of the official to the minister to parliament. Um, and, um, and to go to this point about um, political impartiality and Northcott Trevelyan, um, and I will finish after this, but so on, on the, um, you often hear the civil service described as neutral or independent, and it's neither. It's actually politically impartial. Its job is to serve the government. And the, the way that they preserve, they, the, the importance and the brilliance of preserving their political impartiality that they can serve a government of another colour is, is, is a phenomenal strength. But the way that you um, build that trust is by actually being able to implement the policies of the government and to maintain the skills and capability of the service so that they can deliver. And on the Northcott Trevelyan point, um, the Northcott Trevelyan reforms are often cited as, a, as this protector of, of impartiality. And what they, were, what they came into being for was to actually stop, the, um, to stop cronyism and to allow for appointment on merit. Um, there was nothing about political impartiality in them. It was to stop people appointing their, their favourites and people who weren't qualified. And in fact, um, if we're going to go, I totally agree with Lord Agnew's point about diversity of, of, of thought and diversity of location and, and ways, of, ways of doing things. But actually, the Northcott Trevelyan for reforms basically say that unless you come from one of the great universities, and indeed, unless you did greats at one of the great universities, um, you're actually um, not really going to be allowed to go in. So I, I would actually argue that the North Contravellian reforms, while brilliant and the principle of appointment on merit absolutely critical, because that's how everything should be done, um, but actually, they, if we're going to go down the diversity route, um, they might actually not stand up to such great scrutiny. And on that point, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Some key themes emerging there to add to our list. Um, independence, as you said, the ethos of the civil service, but also interoperability, which you mentioned, which I'm particularly interested in. Um, Dame Patricia, your opening thoughts on the question, what do we want from the civil service? We want uh, professionals who are competent, confident, and who serve the elected government, as uh, Simone Finn said. I've worked with senior officials over many years who are all those things, and I speak as a public servant. Um, but I want to focus on talent, uh, because while the best officials are still the very best, um, in the past 20 years, it's un been undoubtedly harder to find them. And the question is why? 
Firstly, I think because government's changing, uh, media and social media 24-7 pressures cause the Blair-type response of daily political initiatives and so for government, and this eroded confidence at the top of the civil service. Now, freedom of information shifts decision-making to texts and phone calls and keeps Sir Humphrey out of the room. For both ministers and officials, comm skills managing this are ever more important, but so is policy focus under pressure. Then, of course, we all know that the private sector pay has pulled away in law firms and consultancies, as has been mentioned, as well as business. And the gap is many times what it was in the 70s and 80s. So I find the brightest and best youngsters may no longer put the civil service first on their list. But I also think this is about change. My son's generation sees challenge and opportunity, whether as a result of Brexit or the pandemic, and this makes public service more attractive. Of course, Whitehall can't manage that uh, match private sector pay, but since it can't, it must be clever about what it does offer. As Lord Agnew said, job satisfaction, um, attracting the best, training in new skills and careers built across the public and private sectors. I think we need a smaller, better and more skilled civil service and achieving that will require cash, the tackling of process and very often the dead hand of HR. Permsex will tell you that they inherit teams of 30, 40, 50 um, and the people in the role uh, could the role could be done better with five if they had the right skills, data, as has been said, finance, operational skills. So persuade the Treasury to stump up the cost of redundancies at middle level too, and find the time to manage out dead weight. And Lord Agnew's also right. When young talent applies for promotion now, it's often told, oh, you can't move up more than one grade at a time, regardless of capability and need. SIFTs are computerized, even for quite high level internal searches. And the computer will reject you without your department or the recruiting department seeing the application, regardless of experience and qualifications, unless you've learned to play the jargon game around behavior. At the moment, the coppers are recruiting huge numbers. Guess what? After an exam, the final interviews are from a robot. Give me strength. And a few years ago, army recruitment was outsourced. It didn't work. Any successful manager will tell you that recruiting staff is key to attracting talent, identifying skills and developing loyalty. Departments must do it themselves. Now, things are looking up. During the pandemic, the best civil servants suddenly found rules suspended and amazing things achievable. In places you can now outsource quickly if you need to and also recruit and get things done internally in spite of old rules but not widely enough. Habit, old HR fashions and process have been squeezing the life out of the civil service and that must stop. I began with confidence, competence and commitment to serving elected government and I'll end with it. There are two problems in delivering that commitment. The first is that ministers must set clear priorities as soon as they come in and work hard with Permsex and their teams to maintain clarity. This probably needs more training for new ministers and perhaps a stronger and longer serving mixed team of officials and political advisors in private offices. And the second is the point that's come up several times about impartially serving an elected government. The civil service must never fall into the trap of thinking it knows better than the electorate or their representatives. Of course it offers expertise, it speaks truth to power, but it mustn't leak pursue a different agenda, or quietly avoid implementing policies it doesn't like. Re-establishing trust on both sides is key to achieving this, and it will take real leadership. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dame Patricia. Very comprehensive overview uh, there. Um, so, David, can I come to you for your introductory thoughts on the question of what we want from the civil service? Uh, briefly yeah. outline your, your uh, position. Thanks, Ross. I mean... What I think we're looking for are, are three things. First of all, candor, because unless um, a minister can be confident that uh, his officials or her officials are going to offer 
uh, opinions that are and critiques that are both well informed um, and firmly grounded in evidence and are absolutely frank, then we're going to continue to lurch from one bad policy making decision to another. So candor is ab and it's absolutely important. And uh, Patricia's point about mutual trust and confidence is absolutely key to getting that right. And so you know, nobody you knows officials should not be briefed against ministers and vice versa, you know, ministerial briefing or civil, special advisor briefing against named civil servants who can't answer back is profoundly damaging, in my view, to the quality of government overall. Secondly, openness to challenge and to critical thinking. One of the things I found frustrating at times in Whitehall was the, the departmental line and the um, comfortable range of opinions uh, that were taken into account, the predictable groups that were consulted on anything. And when I came into the Foreign Office, for example, I, I mean, I you know, was given a list of the, the key European lobby groups and think tanks of different kinds and to, that they normally talk to. And I noticed that Open Europe was missing. And I said, what's going on here? And they said, well, we don't normally talk to them. They're seen as being a bit, a bit extreme. And I said, well, actually, they're the group that's probably closest to David Cameron's thinking as Prime Minister on all of this. And actually, in fairness, it was changed quickly. And, you know, they opened Europe, Max Pearson and so on, very quickly became um, you know, people who were in and out of uh, officials offices so you know with offering their perspectives on, on 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 things so you can make the changes there but i think Whitehall does need to be less introverted and also more willing to let ministers themselves be personally exposed to uh, outside opinions it's very difficult always for ministers to find time to do that and i found for example in the cabinet office that there was after the carillion collapse there was quite a lot of resistance to the idea of me actually meeting the chief executives of uh, the main strategic contractors with government. I basically said, no, I want to hear direct from them what their particular views are, what went wrong and what changes we need to make. Actually, it's very useful. Just get them all in together, so no special favours, round the table, and hear them with the officials there. So if there were disagreements, they could have them in front of me. And a good technique for any minister, by the way, if he's got a team of officials, is to single out the youngest ones there and ask what their view is. Um, because sometimes you get a different perspective from the one that their senior uh, would like to give. But actually, that, that is why you need to break away from this culture of the de strict departmental line where the, the juniors feel intimidated. Third, the capacity and the skill to implement and follow through policy. Uh, and I, I don't disagree with what other members of the panel have said on that. So what needs to happen? Um, changes? Well, you referred, Ross, to the Ditchley lecture that Michael Gove gave. I mean, there's almost nothing, if anything, in there that I would disagree with, or actually that the best senior civil servants would disagree with. Now, there's a good agenda for change there. I strongly support the idea of a, a, a more cohesive, stronger centre of government incorporating number 10, the Cabinet Office and the Treasury, because, as Patricia, I think, said, you need to join up policy making, policy implementation and the allocation of finance, which at the moment too often take place in different silos in different bits of Whitehall. And a stronger centre would also help to solve the problem of cross departmental priorities, something like rough sleeping, that is a priority for the government as a whole, but which it's difficult to get the Department of Health, or Treasury or others to, to, to treat as departmental priorities, though their input is critical to this. And so the stronger centre helps you to get grip with those priorities. Um, third, I would add devolution, uh, not just relocation. I've become a convert to the idea that we need to give more real autonomy to mayoral and unitary local authority levels in order to get things done, because those authorities have the convening power with local business groups, universities and others to deliver stuff on the ground. And fourth, we need changes, not just with officials, but we need changes from ministers as well. You know, an end to this merry-go-round of ministers who don't last more than six or 12 months in a particular appointment before they and their political advisors are, are moved on. This, you know, the most rudimentary training for ministers, um, the most um, basic and spare 
of induction uh, programs for ministers. That needs to change. And I think ministers need to be prepared to shoulder responsibility for risk. If you're going to experiment, if you're going to innovate, sometimes things will be a brilliant success and we need to be much better at then learning from that and disseminating best practice. But sometimes they'll, they'll screw up. They just won't work. And then the minister has got to give those officials cover and say, look, don't blame that department or that ambassador. They've tried this experiment with contracting out a, a service or with um, trying to end a conflict in a particular way in a different part of the world. You know, that was done with my authority and it, it didn't work and we stopped it now, but it was an experiment that it was worth trying at the time. And then finally, um, I think that ministers need to remember the importance of morale. You know, you're talking about big organisations here. And uh, Simone referred to universal credit, you know, and getting any changes to the benefit system right means not just uh, making sure you've got your ducks in a row when it comes to policy making in Whitehall and making sure you've got the Treasury agreeing to fund whatever is necessary, but you've got to make sure that there is understanding of how this policy is to be delivered right down to pretty junior, pretty low paid staff working in local benefit offices, because if it goes wrong there, that is what is going to ramp up into a, a real scandal and crisis that the government's contending with in the media. So the importance of morale in the civil service is a key ingredient of delivering better quality policy making and delivery. Thank you so much, sir, David. Um, We've got a huge range of issues in scope here in our introduction. So let's, in the time that we have available, try to focus really uh, in a razor sharp sense on just a few of them. The biggest one, I think, coming out of those introductions is skills and capability of officials. So we're thinking of officials all the way through from the fast stream, uh, but to the, to the SCS, the senior civil service, of which is a vast minority of the number of civil servants. We should also remember for a bit of context that only 82,000, I think, approximately civil servants out of 400 100,000 in the country uh, work in Whitehall, so the vast majority of civil servants are already outside Whitehall in the delivery agencies and so on. Um, seeing some of the questions that are coming in through the Conservative Party platform, the one that really sticks out on skills is how do we encourage younger people to get into the civil service, uh, have good prog career progression, excuse me, and allow the civil service to open opportunities for them? So, Lord Agnew, what, what's it, what is the government doing in, in terms of skills? Uh, Michael Gove has been very clear about the need for quantitative skills. Is that the whole picture? Well, the first thing is that we, we've, it's been a labyrinth to get our, our, our hands around the whole training landscape, uh, which is just so convoluted. Um, but by a fluke, uh, the, some major contracts on training uh, are up for renewal at the moment. It's giving us a chance to completely reset the dial. But the whole thing is, is fragmented. And theoretically, there's some £300 million a year available for training. But uh, I can't get a, on a page where it all sits and who's using it and how good it is. So we are, we're working on that with our first priority to have a central library of, of the training resources, which will be quality assured and which will be a single place for the truth. And if a particular unit, whether it's an ALB or a department, has a really good training program, they will need to load it onto this central repository. And it, if it's so good, then we'll use it everywhere. And of course, there's the 80-20 rule. There'll be some, some, uh, some uh, um, development around the edge, but the core module will stay. I mean, one of the most appalling things we discovered is we are paying consultants to re- produce endlessly the same types of training but diff for different parts of government so so that's uh, that's not going to go on for very much longer i hope um we we also want to introduce a much more rigorous pass fail culture in the training because at the moment we are essentially giving a license to operate to civil servants who are not necessarily necessarily able to do it and if you put that in the context of our march budget commitments of 640 billion pounds worth of infrastructure spend 
it's it's very worrying. So we are absolutely going to be focused on the assurance that the training is good, but also it, you have to pass the training before you can be given more responsibility. But that in its own way should be should be liberating for civil servants and uh, and they should get some confidence from that. And I think the points that Patricia and David mentioned about ministerial training are also very important. And we have, we are just running, I think, our first ever ministerial training course on infrastructure management, which Jesse Norman has pushed very hard on and I'm one of the one of the students on that course it's been extremely useful and we want to roll that out further as well. Thank you Lord Agnew. Um, uh, the question I'll extend to the rest of the panel uh, uh, Simone let's start with you. Um, what are the skills that are actually missing then in your experience? You worked in the heart of the cabinet office as did many of our panelists. What are the skills that are missing amongst senior officials and junior officials? I, I would absolutely say, first and foremost, the operational skills, you know, the, the fundamental um, ability to run major projects. The uh, digital skills um, uh, were sort of, the, I mean, the idea of digital in 2010 was that you downloaded the far, uh, form of direct gov or something. Um, so uh, the, the government digital service it, it set up sort of in 2010-11 um, after Martha Lane Fox's report was, was, um, it was a great success by 2016. But actually to, to go to um, uh, uh, David's point that, and, and being in favour of this stronger, more cohesive centre of government, um, recognising that we were missing these skills um, at the centre, at, at, at the, centre the, um, the operational skills, etc., uh, there, were, there were moves to set up a sort of proper centre of government, a, a sort of where, where, the, where you put the leaders of the functions, so HR, commercial, procurement, uh, digital, uh, major projects, and that you would, and the, the idea was that you would get a core centre of expertise at the centre, led properly, but given the correct mandate to flow through government. And these are these are these are sort of common functions to government. They're not the sort of um, you know, they're, they're common to every single department. Now, the problem is, is that nobody disagrees with this is a sensible approach. Everyone says, oh, yes, I agree with the sort of the, 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 the central approach, the central expertise, etc. But then you run into the fact that all these um, department heads have said, yes, totally buy into that model. Oh, obviously, it doesn't affect delivery. Well, yes, of course, it affects delivery of, the, of those um, parts of the function. And oh, but you know, I've got my departmental autonomy. I, my department is different. I can't possibly join in with that. And it's absolute rubbish. So the, the point is that, that, that there are some things that the departments should focus on what they're meant to be doing, i.e. delivering education policy and, um, and, and whatever. But in terms of these core functions, there's, there's, a, there's a lack of the reality for wanting to join in and, 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 and actually allow the centre to, it doesn't mean the centre delivers everything, it means that the centre directs how it's, it's going to run out across government. So, um, and particularly with the digital agenda, if we can harness data collection and the digital agenda and actually make the government digital service sort of give it teeth again, then actually you, you, you can run a writ across government um, quite easily and join up all the departmental silos um, that, that are not joining in. So when you've got a cross departmental agenda, then you can join up using the government as a platform. You can join up the different departments um, and the officials because they, they will all be in one place. Um, but there does need to be license given to this. And it does, you know, we do need to sort of train up people, recruit people. Uh, Patricia mentioned the dead hand of PR, I mean, of, of HR. Um, I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, the processes to get into the civil service can be ludicrous. The recruitment of the, of the staff from universities. You know, when I was at university, the top banks and the top consultancies, you know, they sent their top partners and their best people to persuade the best graduates to join. The civil service sort of just expects everyone to join with some retired civil servants sitting in a recruitment centre and doing some tests. You're not going and you're not going to encourage the best people. It's a great place to work. But, you know, even the reforms we try to put through to the fast track saying give people proper training. Lord Agnew is so correct. That, you know these consultancy firms give some decent training program and then and then let loose these people who are telling you know their equivalent graduates what to do um, for a vast vastly inflated sums it's 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 not difficult learning and training is and development is it's huge and it does mean pe the people above them must be able to give the training and there must be that 
de that development and proper performance management, um, which is, is still a sort of rather woeful, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Th thank you for mentioning the functions in particular, uh, Simone, uh, and I would add to that the professions. So to give some context to the audience, these are uh, ways in which the civil service has already tried to streamline common skills across departments and civil servants are now organised and, and have been for the, almost the past five years into these different streams, if you like, that focus on different specialities like finance, for instance. Um, as a journalist, I have the instinct to try to make some news. So I might just quickly throw back to Lord Agnew and say, you know, ask him, what is the future of the functions because they were seen as the organizing principle to solve many of these issues around capacity and skills and then I'll come to Dame Patricia and, and, and Sir David. Uh, Lord Agni. Yeah it might be worth just explaining to the audience what the functions are. This was a, a concept that Francis Maud created five years ago taking a dozen key streams of activities such as commercial finance, fraud, marketing con so that, that those were the key functions and we Francis put at the same government controls over how they were managed and a, a matrix of, of, uh, of management so that the center of the function in 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 white in the cabinet office had a dotted line to whoever was sitting in an individual department it was a very good sensible clear way to run a very large organization when I arrived in my role a few months ago, it was like turning up in a beautifully landscaped garden that hadn't had a gardener in it for five years. And the reality is that these functions have neglected and we are now endeavouring to, to strengthen the, that, uh, that system again. Indeed, as we speak, Francis is writing me a report. He's been around all of these functions. Uh, I, when I first arrived, I wanted his corporate memory to show me what he set out as his intentions and what's happened in the intervening few years. And uh, it's, uh, well, the first draft arrived last night, so I haven't, I haven't had a chance to go through it in detail. But it's a completely normal way that any large organisation would operate. You want to give devolve authority as much as possible to, to the subsidiary operating units, but overall, the centre needs to know what's going on and have a, a common set of rules. And that's what we're trying to re, 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 uh, reimpose. For example, since he left the spending control function, there have been siren voices that have wheedled some £112 billion a year of expenditure away from the spend control function. Now, that's not acceptable, and we will claw those back until we're confident that those individual operating units are managing that spend properly. And then we, when we're con convinced of that, then I'm very happy to step back again. But you know, that's the sort of thing that we are doing. It doesn't sound exciting, but imagine that I can save 10% of that $112 billion. You know, That's 2p on income tax. So the question of the functions and their sort of uh, organisational future very much alive and being looked at uh, by the current administration. Dame Patricia, you have um, some experience that also comes from working in a regulator, uh, being at arm's length from government and also independent of it. Um, from the official perspective, as a, as a long serving official, what, what do you think about the skills and capability that we need from the civil service in the modern world? Uh, well, I think, as I said uh, earlier, they have not caught up with, adapted to the demands of the modern world. Um, and so keeping on talent, particularly in um, these specialist areas, I wonder if um, Lord Agnew is looking at the way uh, our, our military looks at this kind of thing. They have scholarships in universities. Certainly, as was said earlier, you need to send your best people out to recruit in the universities. And have you looked at the training colleges uh, that the military have? Um, Cromwell is a case in point. Training, uh, you know, kids off the street from Belfast, age 17, right up to very senior officers and creating a, 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 a sense of shared purpose. Um, we've just got to be a lot more professional about all this. Dame Patricia, thank you. Um, Sir David, your thoughts on skills and capability then? Um, I think um, some of it goes down to what Patricia was saying earlier about pay. Um, and I would also like to see uh, a situation where it was regarded as perfectly normal for people to be moving to and from the private sector and the public sector during the course of their careers. Um, one of the things I do, you know, I look at the American system. I'm not, an, I'm not by any means an unqualified admirer of the American system, but actually it's just put, received as perfectly natural there for people to spend some years in government and they go into back to the private sector or into a university or think tank or whatever and then 
They might come back again into government a bit later on in a more senior position. It's a hell of a job to get in anybody from the private sector, um, even to do a specialist role. And I just think that needs to be much more normal. And that, again, means shaking up some of the established conventions about uh, pay and rewards. Um, I also you know, agree with everything others have said about training. Um, I was quite horrified after Carillion to find you know, this. There, there wasn't any um, specific training going on uh, right across government in procurement or in the management of contracts. Um, and when we, we got collective agreement in cabinet to do that, and then of course, once it came to departments individually having to shell out to meet that collective commitment, um, you had all sorts of protests again. It always has to come out of the cabinet office budget. But thankfully, the treasury strongly backed the top slicing departmental budgets to pay for that essential training. But that I think points to one of the key things about the future of the functions. And I very much support the idea of the functions having uh, a, a, a key role in reform. Um, but they have to be involved in the public spending reviews, which hitherto under successive governments have been left almost entirely to bilateral discussions between the Treasury and departmental ministers and permanent secretaries. And that has always led to some um, sort of pretty suspect massaging of financial assumptions. So we will assume that inflation is going to be at this level, that pay can be kept at a, at a certain point, um, and, and so on. And you know, there's, there's a sort of polite fiction that everybody subscribes to, and then two years down the line, it all blows up, something goes wrong, and then we're into crisis and rescue package. So getting the functions involved with the SR it seems to me is a key part of getting this right, which again is why central government uh, has got to involve treasury, treasury as well as cabinet office and number 10. My final point this is where I would slightly, um, not so much you know, quarrel with what, what Cleo and, and Simone said, but I just add something to it, I hope, which is that, um, yes, yeah, stronger center of government, but uh, in a parliamentary democracy, um, you, you have to start with the cabinet collectively signing up to a set of clear priorities and objectives, dipping their hands in the blood and sharing responsibility for it. Um, um, you, know, you can't have a situation where cabinet ministers are a bit like, um, you know, um, Russian or Chinese ministers where their, their job is seen as explaining policies that others have decided. Um, and, 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 I, I, and I think getting, getting that right is Difficult. That you know, takes us some pretty profound questions about size of the cabinet, relationship between prime minister and cabinet ministers, and so on. Thank you, Sir David. Um, uh, that, I, oh yes, please, of course. Sorry, of course. No, can I just? Um, I, I, I to totally agree with absolutely what David said about um, ministers. In fact, his point about ministerial um, induction training is absolutely critical. Too often, um, it has been full of ministers jumping from one thing to another and not enough focus. And of course, uh, reforms, the, even the operational running reforms need to have ministerial support. Um, but I, I would really point out that the whole of the cabinet signed up to um, the, this, this model um, and, uh, under the coalition government. It's never been reversed to, to my knowledge. Um, there used to be a cabinet uh, committee set up to uh, co-chaired by Danny Alexander, then uh, um, Chief Secretary and, and Francis as Minister for the Cabinet Office, um, that oversaw of, you know, the efficiency reforms. I, I, I emphasise these are, these are the operational reforms, then, and, uh, operational uh, running of government. They're not, um, they're not the core policy departments. They're not interfering with, with the running of uh, Secretaries of State's pol policies within the department. It, it frees them up to focus on that, if you like. It, 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 by saving from the running costs of government, you're actually allowing money to be, go to the frontline services. So it's, it, that's why it's so important to be able to do it in the most effective way possible. But I do remember, you know, officials um, totally disregarding um, decisions made by you know the the cabinet the subcommittee that was was sub cabinet committee that was set up and it's very rare that that ministers sort of 
even take an interest in this. But the number of times we were told that oh, the minister doesn't like it to find out that uh, the minister didn't like it. And, you know, I, and I'd ring up and say, why doesn't your minister like this? And it was sort of, my minister doesn't um, care about that. And you'd realise that this was someone causing a little bit of trouble elsewhere. Yes, indeed. I mean, the skills and capabilities and attitudes of ministers, of course, are absolutely essential to the question of the skills and capabilities and attitudes of, of, of officials. And um, I was probably one of the few political appointees ever to bother to log into civil service learning, the sort of online platform, to see how civil servants are trained in government. And um, uh, the government working, as Lord Agnew said, on that ministerial training programme, I'm sure, is the beginning of a much wider sweep of reforms for the capabilities of ministers as well. Um, I'm, in the spirit of the People's Government, looking at the feed of questions which are actually coming in from our audience for Conservative Party conference, and they are focused, I think, more than anything on the issue of culture, really, of the civil service, and also of the relationship between ministers and officials. So one is, what do you think about the relative responsibility of ministers versus civil servants when things go wrong? And that's been a, a kind of feature of recent policy failures. Also, how do we ensure and enforce the politically impartial nature of the civil service in such a partisan world. So let's get into some of these cultural questions because I think that is a subtext to a lot of the more operational and organizational questions. Um, and we start, started about five minutes late. So this segment should bring us through to some closing remarks uh, a little bit later. But Lord Agnew, the culture of ministers and officials, are they, I think as CP Snow, you know, to use that metaphor, two cultures that can't mix? Or, or, or what, needs to, what needs to happen in that relationship to make it more symbiotic? Well, I, I agree with David's point about there being a stronger preparedness by ministers to take responsibility. And uh, my own view, which is probably controversial, is that I think there should be a far greater use of letters of direction by, by ministers to civil servants. So if there is a particular political idea that they want to pursue, but the civil servants are uh, reluctant for whatever reason, there should be a clear line of delineation and the minister should write the letter, and then he or she should stand or fall by the, the outcome of that. And I think that would send a clear message. That's what happened, for example, with HMRC and the furlough schemes recently, because to be fair to HMRC, they couldn't possibly analyze the impact on, on the country or anything else on the finances uh, for such a huge scheme. But the chancellor took the view uh, that he, he would take responsibility. And I think that's a very important part of it. I think Partly it links back to the training of ministers, though, so they have the confidence to, to take these decisions. And I, mean, I, I know from my own experience, I'm, I'm the HMRC Borders Minister at the moment, which is an incredibly complex area. It's very, very hard for me to challenge officials at the moment because I'm still on a very steep learning curve. But if you take my role as head of the government property function, I've been in property for 30 years, I can give the officials a very good run for their money. And I don't hesitate to do so. So I think it's uh, I think it's those two things. Yes, I think that that border between evidence-based policymaking, the reliance on experts that we've seen in the past few months, particularly versus ultimately at the, at the end of the day, ministerial accountability and responsibility is a really interesting one. Dame Patricia, let's let's come back to you and, and tell us about the cultural question here. I know it's one that you've you've worked yeah. on. Um, what is the culture of the civil service now versus the culture of the ministers around senior officials? Uh, as I said, big change in 20 years and uh, too much. I, I'm afraid I go along with the metropolitan elite critique. Now, um, uh, Lord Agnew might be surprised to hear me say I agree about letters of direction from ministers. You know, I was chair of Ofcom. There might have been on occasions disagreements <laughs> between myself and the minister, what would happen would be that those disagreements would be massaged into uncertainty, which paralyzed both sides. I wouldn't have minded getting a letter of direction. The minister would have had to have thought carefully. And if I'd really disliked it, I'd have replied in public. And then, you know, matters would have taken their course. But both sides need confidence. And the other thing is cultural leadership, whether it's from ministers or perm sex. The morning after the Brexit vote, I let my colleagues in Ofcom grieve. And then the following day, I went round to every department and I said, we will not discuss Brexit in the office at all, except there are opportunities here because powers will come back from Brussels that we will need to pick up. 
and work will need to be done on those. But we are completely impartial. And one had to show a leadership on one of these issues that was dividing the country. And officials must not play to the gallery. They must be very, very clear that on all these issues, in the office, you are impartial. Most important thing of all, really. Otherwise, trust is lost. Thank you, Dame Patricia. This is fascinating because um, to give a little bit of context, ministerial directions are a formal instruction, a written instruction from ministers to senior officials to carry out policy, uh, despite officials saying to ministers, we either can't calculate the risk or cost of this effectively, or uh, we think that this is a, basically a, a bad use of public money. Um, so formal directions are often talked of as a kind of negative uh, aspect about ministerial control. But uh, maybe making those clear instructions from ministers public and also the responsibility of officials to give their clear reflection, yes, um, yeah. m it means that there is some uh, transparency over that process. Um, and it makes both sides think very carefully about it. If, uh, if ministers weren't so frightened of it, they wouldn't have to do it because both sides would talk more honestly to each other. I think we've had more directions in the past uh, six months, I think something I, I read than previously in the last number of years. So that does offer at least a degree of transparency, but I guess it also emphasises the uh, concern that there is among senior officials for taking responsibility for some of this um, Im implementation as well. But Baroness Finn, let's, let's talk about culture. Um, you were really at the vanguard of the, Maud, the kind of Maudite reforms, public sector reforms as a whole. Um, what are your views on the cultural compatibility uh, of political culture and official culture? Well, I, I, I entirely agree with um, what Lord Agnew and, and um, Patricia have said. I mean, ba ba basically, there, there, there is a culture in the civil service that you, you get rewarded for um, observing the status quo. Um, when your job should be, how do you do your job better? How do you think about ways and better ways of doing things? And that, that there isn't, we don't give enough permission um, to civil servants, in my opinion, to, to allow them to try new things and to fail. Fail quickly, but it's fine. It's it, give, give it a go, work it out, work out ways, better ways of doing things. So it's, it's this risk averse culture that really massively holds things back. And it's the people who toe the line and keep their, keep, keep their, their powder dry who sort of go on. Um, but to go to the the the, the um, ministerial direction point is is a, is a really important one, and we very much um, wanted to encourage greater use of ministerial direction. So I'm very very glad that 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 that, that they they are being used. They were seen as a nuclear option. You see that everyone was terribly oh you can't do that because oh my gosh you might have to do a ministerial direction. Whereas in fact. Sometimes there isn't enough um, evidence to, to, to justify a policy. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many submissions came up that actually were just jargon ridden and, you'd, you'd, they, and things would be asserted, but you'd say, well, where's the evidence support, to support this? And sometimes it doesn't exist. And sometimes it can't be made as a, as a, as a value judgment and a minister has to sort of take, own that responsibility. And I think it's a very clear, sensible way of doing it, of, of doing things. The other, the other side of the coin is that often what would happen is that officials would come in, they'd give their advice, they'd agree with the minister without sort of putting the trenchant um, counter advice, and, 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 then, and then they'd go out and they, they simply wouldn't do it. The decision wouldn't be implemented. I mean, I re remember, you know, ministers would ask six months later what happened to so-and-so. Oh, it hasn't quite happened. So... It, 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 it is vitally important you give robust advice. It is evidence-based as far as it possibly can be. Sometimes it won't be. And you, you, you then, once the decision is taken, you, you then have to implement it. And if you disagree, and if there, isn't, if there is discomfort, then the minister absolutely should, should own that decision. And I think the ministerial, use of ministerial directions should be absolutely much more widespread. And, um, and it, it puts the accountability fairly and squarely where it should be. This is a, a kind of encouraging call for ministers to take uh, responsibility as well for their their decisions, as well as asking senior officials to implement them. I mean, um, uh, so David, you worked through a period where there was enormous sort of public pressure on issues around Brexit as well, uh, demands from the civil service uh, uh, to make preparations, but also a kind of series of leaks and so on and public controversies. How was that culturally and what was the relationship like uh, in your vast experience between ministers and officials and how could it be improved? I, I never felt that there was a problem in terms of um, officials trying to resist what government um, 
ministers were, tr were, were trying to do. I mean, the basic problem in the time that I was trying to manage um, the aftermath of the 2016 referendum was that the cabinet was divided and, and um, cabinet members were making it very clear through briefings to the press, sometimes 10 to 15 minutes after a cabinet meeting, <laughs> where the divisions were. And you know, that left their respective officials with real dilemmas. You know, are, you know, are they there to support what the prime minister and the formal policy of the government is, or is their responsibility, their loyalty to their secretary of state, who is uh, leaning in a different direction on one or other side of the, of the Brexit argument? Um, and, and, and that take, it takes back, take me back to what I was, what I was saying earlier, that, that, that you have to start with a very clear, collectively agreed policy. If you don't have that, if there's division amongst the cabinet, then you know, your prospects of getting um, a sort of coherent um, uh, an active response from the civil service is, is, is somewhat limited. I agree hugely with, with pretty well all of what Theo and um, Patricia and Simone said. I what I would add is a, is a couple of points. Um, I think to Simone's point about officials um, sometimes sort of uh, nodding politely um, when a minister takes a decision, then just not doing anything about it for weeks or months on end. I mean, that takes us back to the whole area of you, you've got to project managers. You've got to think not just of the policy making, but how you implement it. And that actually means the minister and the special advisors in the private office have to make it clear that it's not just the policy decision, but there's there, right, there's a timetable from now on as to how. Uh, each stage of this is going to be implemented and when you report back to to say what progress you have made and what if any obstacles you have been been facing and, and they just need to be that shift in in culture and it's ministers I think who have the chief responsibility for driving that although you do want perm sex who buy into that uh, and, and, and inculcate that approach to doing business throughout their their departments I agree completely with what Patricia said about um, you know not giving enough permission to civil servants to try something and, and then fail. Um, I think when it comes to responsibilities um, and, you know, who should fall on their sword if, if, if necessary, um, it, it's, it can be quite a fine judgment, but I think it becomes the more senior in the civil service you get and the, the more that a senior civil servant's responsibility for a particular aspect of delivery is clearly identified. I think the more difficult it becomes simply for the official to shrug it off and say, well, the minister is responsible that everything happens in her or his department. I mean, I like pretty well every other minister have gone through the experience of, have, of, of having um, select committees give us a beating up because there's been some human error in our departments. It used to happen on a number of occasions when I was in the Foreign Office and some bit of the Foreign Office, you know, the South Pacific Department, um, didn't realise it was supposed to send a particular letter to Bill Cash's scrutiny committee about you know, an EU Fiji um, sort of uh, fishing agreement or something. And you know, Bill, understandably, you know, get upset about that. And I would always you know, be the one, I would always make that, I will apologise for this. I will, you know, I will grovel um, where sackcloth and ashes. Um, but the next day, I would have the director of that department in my office early in the morning for a meeting without coffee to try and make sure it never happened again. Um, but I do share the sort of anger that a lot of people feel when, for example, you see an NHS trust uh, this being made the subject of a devastatingly critical report not about some experimental policy, but just in basic standards of doing their job. And then, you know, the, 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 the executives involved seem to just move sideways, um, pop up in some other equally senior role six months down the line. Um, and that does happen in Whitehall as well. Uh, and I think that is something that does need to change. Thank you, Sir David. We're, we're just beginning to wrap up the discussion, uh, and I think we've given a comprehensive coverage to the questions that have come in through our platform on the topics that we've dis kind of discussed, um, skills and capability, uh, the culture, the nature of policymaking and the, that process. I mean, 
I'm, I'm just going to throw over to Lord Agnew for some final comments in particular, as you are um, the minister in the driving seat on much of this agenda. With a potential delay to the comprehensive spending review, uh, we're sort of uncertain about uh, timing of budget and so on. Um, what are the next steps on this agenda? What's the roadmap for the next year and how can people influence them? Well, firstly, I would be more optimistic that this spending review is going to happen. I think one of the reasons that the Chancellor cancelled the budget was so that we could focus our resources on the spending review. It's very, very important because we've been rolling over year, years now for a couple of years and it creates a great deal of uncertainty. It's very hard to plan effectively. So. Uh, I could easily be proved wrong, but I, as a betting man, I think we will have our spending review in the next couple of months. I, I think the, last, the bit I just want to focus on at the end is, uh, you, Ross, said quite reasonably that uh, we only have 80,000 of the 450,000 civil servants in London, but they are largely concentrated in one postcode, which, uh, which creates this, uh, this, this metropolitan elite type thinking, which I, I feel is, is, is suffocating. Uh, government's think, way to think. And so I, I'm pushing a lot, very, very hard to get senior civil servant posts out of London. We've made a public commitment to get 22,000 more posts out of London over the next few years. But actually, the key element is, is a higher proportion of the senior civil servants. Uh, and we, we have about 4,500 of those. But they're the ones who actually make things happen. And at the moment, there's a far too great a concentration in central London. And if, if we can get them out of London, we will get this diversity of thought, which will, coming back to some of the things David said, that when you get a group of civil servants around the table, you want to hear the different thinking. You want to hear the, the outlier. You want to hear the one who, who just sees it differently. And we just don't get nearly enough. I spend all, a lot of time encouraging dissent in meetings with civil servants. They hate it. Only after they've worked with me for a few months and they actually trust me enough to start being candid that you start to get some real grit and movement in discussions. And I think that will come much more quickly if you have people who are in the provinces who've come through the route in a very different way. And the way I've come very differently into government, I never went to university. I, I started in life as a, with my first business at 18. I just see things differently. I'm not saying I see them better. But you put me in a room with a smooth mandarin and the two, two of us together will get a better decision than we will individually. Promising news on the CSR then there from, from Lord Agnew. We've got enough time for literally a minute of closing comments from each of our, our panellists. Dame Patricia, let me return to you first. Uh, the takeaways from this discussion for you. If we're going to move uh, policy civil servants out of London, uh, think about interdepartmental hubs around the country so that in one place you've got people, as you were saying, you need centrally from the Treasury base, transport or whatever uh, is needed in the area. Don't just shift whole departments because there's no good putting the whole of transport in West Lothian uh, when they've got to think about commuters or Cornwall. So think about interdepartmental hubs around the country. I know that the, the hubs program and places for growth and other kind of cabinet office programs are uh, under attention at the, at, the, at the moment by Lord Agnew and others. Um, Baroness Finn, your, your closing thoughts on this discussion, what have you taken away? What do we want from the civil service? Um, I, 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 I'm actually very encouraged by the, the uh, discussion today because I, I think that when I was originally working on this agenda in the coalition, it was uh, sacrilegious to criticise the uh, the civil service. Um, it was seen as almost heretical. Um, and actually, I think there is a, a greater acknowledgement uh, today of what you know, what 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 doesn't work, what needs to be put right, and 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 a genuinely genuine honest discussion, and and some and some some and some clear wind behind the reforms, if you like. And I, I, I think that um, I, I think that's quite a positive, um, honest approach that uh, that that we're, we're looking at things and, and moving in in the right direction. So, um, so, 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 so hopefully um, things will things will improve. Thank you. And to come to you lastly, Sir David, your closing thoughts on today's discussion bringing in the sort of long sweep of the past 10 years of Conservative government work, work on this. Uh, what, what are your hopes for the immediate future? I, my, my, my hopes, would be, I'm encu I'd like, like I'm, sorry, I'm encouraged by what Theo said about the, um, uh, the spending review, particularly given that we're expecting the integrated review of um, 
international policy and security uh, imminently. Um, I think that, like Simone, I'm very much welcome the spirit of this, and I'd emphasise that there are plenty of civil servants who will warmly welcome and want to be part of this programme of change. I could, I could, I, I'm not going to name them, but I, I could list a, a fair number who I know would be be very signed up to to this, and that's encouraging. Uh, my two two sort of extra points would be um, regional hubs, yes, um, to Patricia, but please let's not forget about the devolutionary dimension about this. I've just become more convinced over the years that you cannot run everything through 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 Whitehall. You need that convening power uh, of what happens at sort of sub-regional or metropolitan. So David, I think we might have lost your we might have lost your audio or your connection there. Uh, if we can re-establish it, I'll come back to you very quickly. Um, but if, if not, we are hitting the end time of our. Oh, so David, I think we we got you back. That's I know I'm here. I'm quickly with you on that. But do um, do um, use if you're a minister. Use your private secretary. Use your special advisor. They can read the department. They can often flag to you as the minister those dividing lines which have been papered over in the submission that goes to you and then you as the minister can prize those open and, and investigate them during a, a meeting in your office. Thank you and can I extend a very uh, sincere thank you to all of our panellists for bringing their experience and also their very current thoughts and uh, uh, ways of participating in the process of civil service reform. It's very rare to have such a concentration mm -hmm. of panellists who have the kind of expertise but also influence over these questions as we've heard from today. But it's not rare at Policy Exchange where you can tune in uh, to many more discussions of this type throughout the rest of Conservative Party Conference. You can find them all on our website, on the Policy Exchange website. Uh, it's been a privilege to chair the discussion today. I'd like to thank everybody as well for their questions and their comments which came in through the online platform. Uh, and it just remains for me to say thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope this was an insightful discussion and thank you again to our panellists and good afternoon. Thank you, Ross. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat>